that our parents are working together with our educators on behalf of our students. Great opportunities for both. Something in Spanish. So, we are about to bring in our very special guest, speak, guest speaker. Es una amiga para mí. She's a friend for me. Um, I met her some time back and I have learned a lot from her. The school district has learned also from her. There was a good number of parents that they were able to share uh, an interesting workshop uh, a couple of years ago or more than that. And there's great growth ever since then on our local parents from that workshop. She's going to explain a little bit more about that. But also, she has put all those thoughts together and has put a book out. And that book has generated a lot of information and a lot of record uh, that is valid on what a parent is supposed to know and grow on. So she has been doing um, a tremendous job and in, in good efforts to get the word out. And I'm not going to go into details about her bio because you can find it in your book. I'd rather have her get the time and share it with you. So at this time, we have uh, our, our very unique, right? You came from Laredo, okay? If you were to open your, your booklet, you find a little bit of her history, okay? But you can read that letter later. I do want to emphasize her presence and to take advantage of it. That's why we're going to give her this time. And I need for you to help me welcome one of our own. I could honestly say that. Uh, Dr. Susan F. Tierno, who is here with us in the house. We call her also Dr. Sue, okay? But Susan, la amiga Susan, de veras, ha hecho gran esfuerzos para que nosotros como padres de familia nos ayudemos, nos eduquemos, despiertemos las ciertas cosas de nosotros para seguir adelante en nuestras vidas. Vamos a otro fuerte aplauso para la doctora. out of the way. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I stood out of the way so that I could see who was who. And um, probably what brings the greatest joy to me is to see so many parents here. Four years ago, we did a special project which I can tell you was not only a goal, but it was a dedication. So I start all of my talks with a dedication. How many of you have ever had friends of more than 25 years? Okay. What you're seeing in front of you is me 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and my best friend of 25 years, who was married to a West Pointer. My dad went to West Point, my little brother went to West Point, but we were best friends at Marymount College in New York. And there's nobody more important in life than a best friend. Especially when they are so spiritually based and are nothing but your cheerleaders. And for Marie, that's what she was. Marie was Italian, I'm Italian. I'm the only girl in five generations in an Italian family. 
While my parents have passed on, all of this was dedicated especially to them and my doctoral work to them because they gave me the knowledge and skills. I have to tell you that if you have best friends, stay close to them because you learn a lot. And you have a beginning of a tribe that goes with you throughout your life. Now Marie passed away at 43, just four months after this picture. And so I pray to her every day for strength. Because I was one of those people that had just reached a federal grant of three million dollars. And while we worked hard for it, we had a parent program. And I wanted to name that parent program insistently. Parents are terrific. And she said to me, honey, I'm gonna die in a few months. Please don't tell me I'm terrific. I have five kids and it's a balancing act every day. Please, let your parents know how powerful they can be with their children's thinking skills. So she named the program appropriately, Think Parents Are Powerful. Now by the time I got finished or started with my doctorate, my dissertation chairperson said to me, okay, you need to bring all the research up to date so that this powerful program can be shared. Now, if you were in my research, can you raise your hand? I know there's a couple of you mommies that are here. Yay! There is nothing that makes me prouder than to know that the mommies that attended five, six, seven days of training, the two school principals who devoted their time and effort in helping, there's nothing more powerful than to build a tribe that can carry on the thinking. The idea was to how to get engagement with parents and schools. And look what we have here as a result. And so blessed am I that I got to work with Pat Compos because she was my original boots on the ground. So I wore my boots today to remind you that it takes a lot of thinking and effort to put one of these together. But when you come, there's critical mass of information that swirls around. So I want to share that with you because there's only one thing I want you to remember, okay? When you care about someone more or something more than yourself, you are a guardian. When you care about someone or something more than you care about yourself, you are a guardian. So I'm giving you this because there's only three things that I'm going to start with because the brain only remembers three things. So principals, federal directors, parent liaisons, coordinators, anybody who's here, if you have not read Simon Sinek's work, The Why, or start with The Why, you need to read it. So I am here today to tell you how powerful you can be as a guardian, and a guardian is a parent. I'm also here to talk about the brain and then the facts that go into what you can do to help your children. 
I am not here as a parent. I'm not here as a, a, a teacher. I'm not here to lecture you. I'm just the researcher that put it all together and love sharing it with all of you. I think with people moving around, we're ready to go to the next one. Okay. Here it goes. I'd like for you to look with purpose at this particular video that I share with you. And by the way, I don't have the rights to it, so parent principals, you're welcome to make your point. This is probably my most meaningful message to you. This is about your purpose. Preparing them for the ultimate meeting. 
watch them care for something outside of themselves. And that purposefulness creates contentment. There are guardians in our pastures. They are real. And they are watching. So I couldn't be more honored than to share this with you because when our research mommies watched this video, everybody was crying. And the purpose of it is to let you know that you are a guardian. You have children. You care about them more than yourself. You really are the ones that make the difference. A teacher can, a principal can, a grandmother can, but the guardian, the one who had those babies, is the one who makes the difference. So let me share some tips for you. Let me just share some information. In our research study, we came out with three significant attributes, three significant pieces of major themes that ran like thread through the days of training. One, our mommies learned knowledge and skills that were critical for them and their children. Two, they began to understand what social capital means. That means I build my tribe, just like me and Marie, I build my tribe around me to help my children, my sisters, my aunts, my, my brothers, my uncles, anybody that can help me in a neighborhood. And the third thing that was significant is the emotional capital. What they learned and its effect on the family. So let me just share that the brain that you see above is the why we are here today. All kids come with brains. There is a size to the brain. It's about three pounds. As an adult, it's about three pounds. So if you're thinking of losing weight, principals and ladies and gentlemen, it won't come out of your brain. It also has functions and connections. And there is a role that you need to play in all those functions and connections. The brain is built for thinking. The facts are that the connections are neurons that are highly organized. They're not organized by anything except the way, all I can think of to say is the way God planned it. We are human beings that think in higher orders. So every part of this brain has a structure and it has a function. It's extremely critical in its structure and its function. Every age has a window of opportunity for children to learn. But the most important thing is that because you care about something more than yourself, you're here today watching what little tidbit of information can I pick up to help my child? So let me share the next item. I, I had hoped that she, I think I can switch it on here, but I don't know where my, my, my person went, so let me talk it through. The brain is made up of a hundred billion neurons. That means cells. 
those neurons all have dendrites. These dendrites all connect. And what's so critical is how we as guardians help them connect. The most important thing we need to know about them is, okay, if there's a hundred billion neurons, what are they doing? They're creating memories. Because without memory, life would be just one episodic event after another. Because memory is something that we have short term and that we have long term. And you have to build the short term in order to get the long term. But they finally decided, several researchers, that memory is the process by which everybody retains knowledge and skills for the future. So why do I say that to you as a guardian? Because I need you to remember that your children are growing into a future we will not know. So let's just play a little clip of this few minutes so that you can kind of see what's the going on in your brain. The first steps towards understanding the electrical properties of individual neurons. We learned how electrical forces and diffusion give rise to membrane potentials. And we learned how cells can generate and propagate signals called action potentials, or spikes, along the membrane. Okay. Understanding the properties of the neuronal membrane is essential. But understanding just these properties isn't sufficient to give us insight into collective behavior of the billions of connected neurons in our brains. Luckily for us, we can approach neuroscience at many different scales and levels of analysis and we don't have to confront the full complexity of everything all at once. That's what we'll be exploring throughout the rest of this course as we slowly go from our understanding of single molecules, such as ion channels, to the electrical behavior of neurons, to their collective behavior in small circuits, and finally onto how they become organized in large functional regions of the brain. Let's start simple though. Since we've examined one neuron, a logical next question is how do two neurons connect with one another? We'll first examine some basic cellular anatomy of neurons. So far, we haven't made too much of the fact that the majority of neurons are polarized cells. That is, they have one portion of the cell for receiving inputs and another portion for sending outputs. The parts of the cells that are specialized for receiving inputs from other cells are called dendrites. The word dendrite comes from the Greek word dendron, meaning tree, and as you can see, the dendrites have a branching, tree-like structure. A signal received by a dendrite is passed to the cell body. If there is sufficient depolarization of the cell body membrane to initiate an action potential, then an action potential is sent down the axon. The axon then carries the propagating action potential to another neuron. So what actually happens at the boundary between two neurons, between the axon of one neuron and the dendrite of another? This interface is called a synapse. There are two general types of synapses. Electrical synapses and chemical synapses. Electrical synapses are less common in our own nervous systems. Okay, I'm asking her to stop. A rather, it's not a biology lesson, but a rather important video. I want you to remember one thing from it. That our brain looks like an entanglement, a web. And every dendrite, every end of those neurons has to touch something else in order for our brains to think, in order for you to listen today, in order for your kids to be able to have a learning behavior, in order for us to cook, in order for us to sew, in order for us to do anything. One dendrite has to touch another. Okay, so what's important about that I want you to remember 
the synapse. But they make up this whole entire three pounds. Can you imagine a hundred billion neurons making up this whole entire three pounds? Okay, now why is this important? Because the front of our brains is called the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is significant because it organizes and plans. So if you see your children not able to organize their backpacks or plan their homework out, it's because the frontal lobe does not come to maturity until age 16. So one tip for you, start young. Training them how to organize. Organize their toys. Organize their food. Organize anything you can get them to organize. Please don't do it for them. Model it. Every time your child does something new, he or she grows a new dendrite. The top of your brain, if you just put your hand on the top of your head, don't worry ladies, you won't mess up your hair. Just put your hand on top of your head. That's called the thinking cap, the cerebellum, the cortex, where all the higher order thinking takes place. The dendrites have to connect there in order for memory to take place. The back of your brain is it significantly important because it deals with spatial relationship. Can I stand up? Can I sit down? Can I sit in my chair without falling out? All of those things are important at the back of the brain. You can see in the second side of the brain there are sensory cortex. Every dendrite has to touch some other dendrite in order for all of these things to grow. Nobody teaches them except you. You are the guardian. Neurons are organized through all of these cells to make up those three pounds. So it's what we do with those three pounds that makes it so important. These three pounds also, in childhood, help us to develop some pretty significant information. Now I have to say, I didn't just do this research through four years of a doctorate. It was 25 years in the making. So long ago, I created a little, um, as you saw, the backpack and the organizational planning portfolio for parents simply because there were significant pieces, bits of brain information that you needed to know about your child brain-wise and socio-emotional-wise. So the next important thing was, take a look from birth to seven. They say that a hundred billion neurons that children are born with begin to fall away up through the age of three. Now that's kind of scary for me because we're putting kids in school at age three. So now, what are we gonna do? Rebuild those new cells. When we were in our research groups, we significantly asked every single parent to analyze the number of kids they had, their age levels, and also to look to see if their oldest children were somewhat like the ages of their younger children. And the answer was yes. Okay? And by the way, please don't think you have to analyze this and, and know it immediately. Pat will have this for you. She'll get a copy and you can get one too from your parent liaison. But it's important that you know that if your oldest children are acting like your four-year-olds, there are steps that are listed for you. You want to take advantage of the fact that 
even up through the age of 13. From 4 to 13, the most significant memories are built. Short term and long term. And those memories have to help us build knowledge and skills. Go ahead. Next one. Thank you. It's still clicking on that one. Thanks. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, as we get closer to the end here, I want to ask you a question. So if it's not something about their brain or the socio-emotional behaviors, then um, what do my kids eat today should be the next question that you ask. Okay, what we found in our research was exactly what the researchers talked about. Hot dogs, cotton candy, cupcakes, french fries, hamburgers, all that great pizza, all that ice cream, all of it affects the synapses or those dendrites that meet one another. So too, if you are feeding a constant diet of this, it's making it harder for your children to gain those memory pieces for their knowledge and skill. So how can you as a guardian have a significant effect? Okay. The first one is, I'm not going to tell you what to go buy. While we were in our research groups, we made lots of menus that we could afford. I'm not going to tell you how to go on a diet. I'm not going to tell you what to feed your children. But I am going to tell you that food affects your children. It affects their behavior. It affects whether the dendrites connect. Medicine affects their behavior. If they have a cold or they have the flu and they're on medication, I'm telling you, it affects whether the uptake of memories takes place. 